And Neil deGrasse Tyson joins us now from New York ahead of his next speaking tour of Australia in July. His latest book is called Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Welcome to Late Line. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Astrophysics for people in a hurry sounds like you were trying to be polite when you just could have called it Astrophysics for Dummies. <laughs> that title was already taken, but, <laughs> but apart, from, apart, apart from that fact, uh, it's actually for people who are deeply curious but who live a full day. They have a job, they go to school maybe, they have kids, and they're just little snippets of time in their day where they would not otherwise be served. They would not otherwise fulfill the curiosity that they know they have retained, perhaps since childhood, or perhaps it's been fanned by other, uh, maybe they saw a documentary or, or they read some other book. And this is my attempt to curate a, a, a selection of mind-blowing cosmic knowledge into a small volume so that I can serve the people who are too busy to read fat books. And that was, that was the motivation. But no, anyone who's read it, they're not saying it's for dummies. It's, you got to get in it. It's, it's real. I, I agree. And I got the distinct impression while I was reading it that while you say you've written it to help improve people's scientific literacy, it's not really an altruistic endeavour you want to almost feel a responsibility to make people smarter about science. Well, it's an interesting uh, way to think about it. I think it's, 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 it's not a responsibility, sure, but I, I think of it as a duty. If I have the capacity to do so and it could serve the greater good, then I would be irresponsible if I did not. And that's how I think about it and that's what motivates me. I wanted to ask you why you chose the particular quote you did to start the book. It reads, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. The quote is, of course, by a famous scientist, you. <laughs> well, I just, it's, <laughs> there are other quotes from other scientists in the book. But uh, the, the, my point there is, so often you get people who maybe haven't studied science deeply or don't know what science is or how and why it works, they will invoke their own sort of sensory judgment as to whether they, judge, they assess something to be true. But science, when it reached maturity, I would say beginning 1600 and onward with the near simultaneous invention of the microscope and the telescope, enabling investigations into two completely different directions in the universe, we are taking in knowledge and insight and information that had no relationship to our five senses as we evolved in the plains of Africa. Those senses that we've developed were really good for knowing if the lion wants to chase you and then eat you. They're good for that, but they're not good for the quantum physics or expanding universe or a big bang. And so that's why I lead off by saying the, the, the universe is under no obligation to make sense to us. It's the observations that matter, even if they conflict what feels right to you. We have learned to trust the observations because that is the measure of reality. In response to President Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Climate Accord, you wrote to your 7.6 million followers on Twitter, if I and my advisers had never learned what science is or how and why it works, then I'd consider pulling out of the accord too. Without American leadership in climate action, what are your gravest fears for the future of the planet? Well, yeah, so the problem is, you know, it's, it, by the way, it's too easy to just beat up on, on elected leaders. I take a very different view of this. Uh, people like saying Tyson attacks Trump. I've never mentioned Trump in any tweet ever. And so the, the, for me, if he's duly elected and his supporters like what he's doing, then the issue is not about him. It's about his supporters, my fellow countrymen. And so as an educator, I feel like maybe they don't really deeply understand how this works, how science works, what a scientific truth is. What it, what, when, when multiple experiments agree, and not every single experiment, because you have a, you'll always have a range, an, an experimental range in the results people get. But when there's an overwhelming uh, uh, a consensus of observations and measurements, not a consensus of opinion, it's not about opinion, it's about measurements and observations. When they align, you don't have the luxury to cherry pick 
the extremes of these measurements and then declare that that's what is true. I, you could do it in a free country, but if you start rising to power and then base legislation on it, then you are building a house of cards of decisions that have no correspondence to a reality. So I, it's incumbent upon me to at least tell the public that if it's a free country, yes, but your decisions or your absence of decisions have consequences. And I just share the consequences with people because maybe they didn't otherwise know this. And it's the, it should be the duty of all scientists to, con to spend some part of their lives engaged in this kind of activity. Climate science and the opinions of it uh, is an incredibly vexing issue in this country as well as in yours. We have parliamentarians who are very vocal uh, in denying and calling scientists who, who deal in this issue alarmists. How do you personally counteract the people who would say you and others in the scientific community are alarmists? What is the single blow your mind fact that you throw back at them to help dispel any kind of doubts? Yeah, I, I just say, you know, if you gained a few pounds last week, do you want to repeal the law of gravity because you disagree with the consequences of it? Uh, are you uh, you know, when Einstein wrote down E equals MC squared and it became the foundation of the nuclear arsenals in the Cold War, will you say, oh, I choose not to believe that? When, when the National Academy of Sciences, one of our most revered institutions, uh, not simply because they, 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 they're, they're of high rank, but because they get together and establish objective truths about what science tells us about our, our lives, our environment, about the world. This is an agency that told us that smoking causes lung cancer. This is an agency, and, and, and yes, there was conflict at the time. Uh, uh, the smoking companies, the, you know, uh, uh, R.J. Reynolds, and, and uh, they were objecting to it, of course, because it would affect their bottom line. But the truth reveals itself even in the middle of whatever subterfuge is going on. This agency, over the years, by the way, uh, this agency, the National Academy of Sciences, was, was signed into law by Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln in 1863, in a year where he had a whole lot of other concerns, in the middle of the Civil War, the, he, the, the Gettysburg Battle, his Gettysburg Address, he says, I think we could benefit from advice from a body of scientists who can think about how to make, how to advise us, how to, how to guide us in ways that science can influence policy. And so that relationship between the U.S. government and science has crossed the aisle many times. Abraham Lincoln was a Republican president. Um, uh, our most important legislation that created the Environmental Protection Agency, all right, in 1970, was signed into law by a Republican president, all right? So this is not, historically, has not been a partisan issue. It's been, people have understood what role science plays in our lives. It's only recently, and so that concerns me because it's, it's destabilizing for the future, not only of the country, but of course for the world, if the United States had such a leadership role over all these years. We sought questions from our viewers and I'll throw the first one at you from Jonathan Russell, who writes to us via Facebook. How do we band together to save ourselves in a world of misinformation, disagreement and plain disregard without undermining democracy? Yeah, I think the, you know, I think the internet landed in our lap and we all celebrated the access to information, but I don't think we foresaw one of the consequences of it, which is with brilliant search engines, you can have whatever idea, however fringy it is, type it into the search engine and you will find every other person in the world who has exactly that same idea, giving you false affirmation of it being true. And now you say we are true and everyone else is not. And what it has done is it f has fractured the world. I don't know that we all uh, saw that coming. So what we need is a tandem way in the educational system to, to uh, inoculate us against being distracted by false information that's out there. Uh, 
This, this, would, this should be a fundamental part of what it is to be educated, being able to judge what is true and what is not. And by the way, science literacy may be the best kind of inoculation against that because it, tra it trains you. It's not so much what you know. Yes, you should know how an internal combustion engine works or what evolution is or the Big Bang. Sure. But deeper than that is science literacy is a capacity to know how to think about information and how to turn data into information, information into knowledge, and then knowledge perhaps into wisdom. That is an arc of science literacy. Without that, it is a free-for-all of information that's out there. And so, so no one wants to get rid of the internet. No one wants to constrain the internet. We like to keep our freedoms, but we want to be informed as we are bathed in our freedoms. Otherwise, we will not be good shepherds of it. Okay, so David Powell has sent us a video question along these same lines. Let's take a look. Majority of the people out on this planet believe that the Earth is still a globe. I've recently encountered someone who believes it's flat. Um, it's created by NASA as a conspiracy and a cover-up. And all the images we see of the universe are created by CGI. Uh, my question is why do, they, do these people exist? And can you please show them some light? Thank you. So, can you shed uh, some light? Yeah, again, it's, there's some missing education. It's a, it's a failure of the educational system. And, yeah, you can go chase after these adults who speak this way. And I, I don't know that I have the time. I don't know that you have the time to do this. But what we do know is, though, if... <laughs> Again, in a free country, let them think Earth is flat. I, I'm not going to chase down people. But the danger would come about, well, the problems would arise if that person runs for office, rises to power, and then decides to become head of a space agency. That, that doesn't work, all right? No, no. So what, you, what happens there is you get someone who is underinformed or just simply ignorant granted power over people who are not. And that does not work in a democracy at all. That's an inversion of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a knowledge pyramid that will, that will t ride a ship off the edge of your flat earth uh, as you pass legislation that doesn't otherwise understand that. There were people 100 years ago who, uh, by the way, there's a passage in the Bible where it's uh, 1 Kings 7, I think, 2 Kings 7, where it describes the shape of King Solomon's pond outside of his castle, outside of his, man um, the, uh, his residence. And it says, it is round on all sides, 30 cubits across, 30 cubits around, 10 cubits across. Well, if you divide those two numbers, you get 3.0. That is the Bible's attempt to give you the value of pi. OK, but I could, <laughs> the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the diameter. Well, that's the wrong answer. OK, pi has actually some decimal values there. There were places that wanted to legislate the value of pi because of that value that had appeared in the Bible, legislated to be 3.0. These are people who don't understand mathematics in charge of legislation. And so we... Uh, Something's missing in the educational system when people do not know when they don't know something. That's another part of how you should be trained. Do, do you know when you don't know something? And I don't require leaders to know everything, but if you know that you don't know something, then you bring in advisors who do. That is the sign of great leadership. Okay, another video question. This one from Richard Lobb. Hello, Neil. My name's Richard Lobb. My question for you today is, if matter and antimatter were reduced to equal rates at the beginning of the universe, could these antiparticles still exist today? And if so, what sort of effect could they be having on our current universe? Thank you. Matter and antimatter. Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, oh, just a quick thing about the flat Earth. Uh, during a lunar eclipse where the sun casts Earth's shadow on the surface of the moon, You'd have some lunar eclipses where the shadow would just be a flat line, and that has never happened. <laughs> what a that relief. just has never happened. 
<laughs> it has always been, it's always been a curved surface. And the only thing that makes a curved shadow, no matter the angle of the, of the illumination, is a sphere, just so you know. Uh, about a antimatter, yeah. I mean, the early universe, all our understanding of the early universe, and I, I detail this in the book, by the way, there's a whole section on just this, this episode where all matter would have had an antimatter counterpart. But what happens is we know that they annihilated. Matter and antimatter, when they get together, they annihilate and they make energy. In this case, it makes photons of light, okay? So what's interesting is how come there's still matter left over? Well, there's not much matter compared to how much matter plus antimatter there used to be. There's just a little bit left. And there was what we call a breaking in the symmetry of the universe, which is not well understood, but we know it happened. And that symmetry breaking made slightly more matter than antimatter particles. And that slight extra is what was left over after everyone paired up at the dance party, all right? You pair off everybody, and it looks like it's about 50-50. Everyone pairs off, and what you'll see is those who remain, who were slightly more matter than antimatter, and that constitutes all the matter that we know in the universe. So no, the, the antimatter manifests in the form of light, photons coursing through the universe. That is the, the, the leftovers of what was once matter annihilating with antimatter. I, ha I have one more that I can ask you very briefly, and it's from Xavier Andrews, who sent us a video question. Oh, I'm not sure if we've got it. Here Hello. we go. Um, just wondering, uh, do you think that we are alone in the Milky Way galaxy, or could there be other life? Thank you. We have only brief time. Yeah. Are we alone? I got gotcha. you. I got you. So often when people ask that, they wonder if there's other intelligent life or other sort of macroscopically interesting life. But to a biologist, if you find a microbe somewhere else, we're not alone. There's other life somewhere else in the universe, in, in, certainly in the galaxy. So right now we have 3,000 exoplanets orbiting other stars that could be repositories of life as we know it, or, or even better, life as we don't know it. All studies of the universe, the molecules and the prev of, in life and the prevalence across the galaxy, the frequency of planets tells us that it would be inexcusably egocentric to think that we are alone in the universe. Neil deGrasse Tyson, I really am disappointed we're out of time. I thank you so much for uh, giving us your time this evening. Thank you. You only left half hour for the whole universe. <laughs> the next time, have more. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs>